along with a Bachelor of Arts in International Relations with first class honours from the same university. He also holds diplomas from the Chartered Institute of Public Relations in the United Kingdom. He is a polyglot, I'm always impressed by polyglots, speaking English, Italian and Maltese fluently with what he calls a fair knowledge of French, Arabic and Russian. Whoa. Additionally, I, yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Additionally, Chris is a member of the Public Relations Institute of Australia, Toastmasters, Rotary International, and the ACT Writers' Centre. So he's almost a Renaissance man. <laughs> Tonight, Chris is going to talk about Ozymandias himself, otherwise known as Ramses the Great or Ramses the Second. Far from the pessimistic tone set by Shelley's poem, I would suggest that Ramses II's reputation has experienced somewhat of a resurgence, enjoying an ongoing place in the public psyche over the years. In fact, just this morning, I was helping out at my son's primary school, and Ramses cropped up in, of all places, a tween's adventure book about a group of teenagers who don't know one another, but upon whom the fate of the world rests. The kids love it, and it receives a creditable three and a half stars on Goodreads. I'm sure that even this brief mention in popular culture would fan Ramsey's gargantuan ego from whatever his vantage point in the afterlife. But tonight we move from the ridiculous to the sublime. And I might add that Chris will take questions afterwards, and he's actually also said that he's going to ask questions of the audience. Three questions with three alcoholic rewards. So, <laughs> so listen up. Now I know why everyone's here. Okay. Please join with me in giving a warm welcome to Christian Benici as he speaks to us on the subject of Ramses the Great, the father of PR. Over to you, Chris. With such a presentation, now I hope that I would live up to the expectations that Alison has uh, stated. <coughs> This is a public lecture and uh, I thank the Canberra Archaeological Society for giving me the opportunity to present this finding. This is the third time today that I am speaking about Ramses the Great. I did so this morning with a journalist from Fairfax Media. I did so at Toastmasters International and I'm doing so now at the Australian National University. It's a hat-trick to speak in World Cup jargon that I am delighted to do again and again. This is, a, this is a discovery I did four years ago when I was a consul in Egypt. And the discovery itself made some progress from featuring front pages and leading newspapers to also being the oldest case study displayed in the Museum of Public Relations in Broadway Avenue, New York, USA. Without further ado, let's start the lecture. There will be time for questions. The lecture content. The aim of the lecture is to see if Ramses II, also known as the Greg, is the founder of public relations. We will have an introduction, methodology, literature review, background to Ramses's the second reign, external relations management, internal relations management, and conclusion. Just keep in mind that what I'm trying to do is using Egyptology to establish Ramses as the father of public relations, or to be more politically correct, the founder of public relations. <laughs> so we have to start with some literature review. Definitions. What is the definition of a founder? A founder is someone who found something. Example of founding fathers Every discipline has a founding father. The founder of history is Herodotus. The founder of modern political science, or political science as we know it, is Niccolò Machiavelli. Is Ramses II the founder of public relations? Yes, that is from the epic movie with Charles and Heston, this is Jules Brenner, The Ten Commandments, 1950s movie, but it's 
word sing. Then it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so definition of founder. A founder is someone who formulates the basis for something. Now, what about definition of PR? Like, without looking at the screen, can you tell me what you think is public relations? Any ideas? What is public relations? Yep. Uh, trying to manage and influence the views of the public. Definitely. And usually from one organisation or section of the community, trying to influence other <coughs> sections of the community and organisations working on that relationship. Definitely, very good answer. Any more input? Yes, you're very right. I chose reputation. Two, at least. One is the one used by the Public Relations Institute of Australia, <coughs> which is the deliberate, planned, and sustained effort to establish and maintain mutual understanding between an organization or individual and its order publics, pretty much what you said. And the other one is from the Chartered Institute of Public Relations in the United Kingdom. Public relations is about reputation. The result of what you do, what you say, and what others say about you. Strictly speaking, we are public relations practitioners all agree that it's about reputation and relationship management. Background. We have to discuss the background. Now this is where Egyptology comes in very handy. But the importance of background in the ambit of public relations is, as Jekyll et al. put it, public relations practitioners need not only to understand communication processes, but the social and organizational context in which communication takes place. And the main aim behind all this is not just to establish Ramses as the founder of PR, but to show that PR is a very serious discipline, a discipline that has existed because it was necessary for thousands of years. Who ruled Egypt and how? Egypt was probably one of the most and first centrally planned states in history. It was ruled by a pharaoh, a sort of sun king. He was Horus reborn, he was a divinity. And it was important that he looked that way to the people. It was thanks to pharaoh that the Nile flooded and the crops were fertile. And it was thanks to pharaoh that there was peace. The Egyptian worldview was that the lands ruled by Pharaoh were a paradise, and beyond that there was chaos. In fact, many a time you would see that the foreigner is portrayed in many depictions as the inferior and as the inherent enemy of this peace. Akhenaten. Have you ever heard about this pharaoh Akhenaten? Yes. Can you tell me something about him, at least the most important thing that he is known for? Monotheism. 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 Now, with that, in the context, I'm not going to go into the monotheistic religion nor the architecture revolution that he started. What I am going to go in here is that what Akhenaten did was shocking for Egyptians. This was one of the worst periods in their lives. Egyptians who had believed in many gods were now persecuted by their own pharaoh. Well, as it happens when a ruler and the people are not in agreement together, one of them have, one of them suffers, in this case it was Akhenaten, and Akhenaten was replaced. The most popular pharaoh of them all, King Tut, died without an heir, 
and there was a vacuum in Egypt. Now this vacuum was taken by the Ramesses, Ramses family. The family of Ramses were not of royal descent. They were from the military caste. And Ramses then had to look at A, the pharaohs that preceded Akhenaten because this period had to be omitted from Egyptian history. So Ramses was looking at very big pharaohs, Amenhotep III, the richest pharaoh and probably most successful of them all. Two years ago, I presented the lecture Amenhotep III, the father of, the father of diplomacy. And Tutmosis III, the Napoleon of the East, a great conqueror. So it was to these expectations that Ramses had to live up to. Not only military, not only prosperity wise, but also in the architecture. There was a lot of pressure. What was against Ramses? Times had changed. Egypt's neighbors had become very powerful. Egypt was not the alpha power anymore, the sole alpha power anymore. Far from it. External relations, remember always when, a, when a, we are doing this in a public relations sample, what were the major threats? Threat number one came from pirates called the Sheridan Pirates. These were sea peoples from the Mediterranean and in the second year of Ramses, now when I say the second year of Ramses, Ramses was perhaps 19 or 20, so he was very, this is a very young pharaoh, very young man. Sheridan pirates attacked Egypt. Ramses won against them. Now, he was young, and later on we will see he might have done some mistakes, but not with the Sheridan. He did not kill them. He saved their lives and actually incorporated them in his bodyguard. This was a very good investment for the young pharaoh to make. The Hittites. We will discuss them in detail, rearmament, and just keep in mind that an organization just, which, which does not respond to external circumstances will atrophy and fail. These were the Sheridan pirates of legend that Ramses defeated in his second year. The Hittite Empire. This is, the green part is Egypt. Egypt would go down as well, going up to Canaan. That's the strategic city of Kadesh. And that is the Hittite Empire, the Red Patch. So as you can see, the Hittites were a very, very powerful empire in the region, bordering Egypt and always encroaching on Egypt's territory and influence. During the period of, or till they re-established themselves, so, so to speak like that, the, the Ramesses, Egypt went backward militarily. It had ignored its military. On the other hand, the Hittites didn't. The Hittites discovered the secret of iron and started producing iron weapons. Now, you do understand that this is huge. This is like going with tanks against cavalry. And in fact, the Hittites developed their own tanks. Chariot exi chariots existed, but the Hittite chariot was a force to be reckoned with. Whereas the Egyptian chariot was a sort of Apache helicopter because it was used for missile weapons. The Egyptian chariot had a driver and an archer. The Hittite chariot, it was meant to charge infantry or actually anything that it could. It was a heavy chariot strong and sturdy, driven by a charioteer, 
a shield bearer and an armored warrior who threw javelins at the enemy at close range. Hence the probability to wound and kill is greater and also that units in military terms much depended on their cohesion. If you could break their cohesion with a chariot charge, they would scatter and the battle would be won. The Carthaginians would do this to a great effect with elephants, for example. The Egyptian chariot was different. Of course, it was more beautiful, as we can see. But apart from that, it was not a close combat chariot. It was a swifter chariot, it was a more maneuverable chariot, but it was a chariot that you shot arrows from. Now, you have to keep in mind, so you have Ramses, and Ramses knows that the Hittites are a threat. Ramses decides on a preemptive strike against the Hittites. And Ramses understood the power, or if he would be alive, probably he would understand it, the power of prime time television, because he did not make this as a secret. No, in court, everyone knew we are going to march against the Hittites. Public relations. And, in fact, Ramses managed to gather 16,000 troops and 2,000 chariots which for Egypt, it was a good job. What was facing Ramses at Kadesh, but was a little bit more. <laughs> the king of the Hittites had 40,000 infantry and 3,700 chariots. Keep in mind, on each chariot there are three men. On the chariot of the Egyptians there are two men plus the superior technology, iron versus copper and bronze. That's another thing. Probably we don't know whether the Hittites had superior tactics, but they were expanding. So I would say that even their tactics were more up to date than those of the Egyptians. And Ramses would pay a price for that. Ramses, young, impetuous, marched at the front, according to the author Christian Jacques and also eminent archaeologist he tells us that Ramses also had a lion with him but he marched only with one division, 4,000 men and his chariots at one point in time as he's marching ahead he captured two Hittite spies and the Hittites told him that the Hittites are far. Then Ramses captures another Hittite spy. It is time to be sure that he's saying the truth. He used a persuasive stick. And thanks to this persuasive stick, he knew that actually the Hittites were about to attack. And as soon as he conveyed this message to everyone in the army, 3,700 Hittites chariots charged the Egyptian camp. There was chaos. Almost all the Egyptians seeing the fierce Hittite chariots fled. And here I have to really underscore the fact many great emperors did flee from the battlefield when faced with such threats. Instead, not only did Ramses not flee, he charged the enemy. He and his shared bodyguard, enemy turned friend, charged the enemy. And it is disputed what happened. Some say it was the Egyptians who lost. Some, of course, Ramses told us that he won. I can assure you that even if Ramses, because I believe he is, is the founder of PR, no, even the best communication can make a defeat into victory. 
The second thing, it was the Hittites who sued for peace, not the Egyptians. What really happened is that Ramses destroyed the chariots of the Hittites, but then he was wise to see that the infantry of 40,000 strong was a little bit too much probably, so uh, something had to be done, and something was done. He returned back home as a conqueror. Just try to imagine, try to even as an audio visual as well, the Aida of Giuseppe Verdi. Ramses parading. This is what he wanted to convey a message. He want his wanted his public to understand that the, now the threat is over. Perhaps Kadesh was not taken, but the threat is over. No Hittite will encroach into our land anymore. And he wanted to make it so clear. Now, this is very important. It's not just about the ego of a man. It's just also about the economy. Peace of mind makes the economy run. As do then how he did it by embarking into big public projects and monuments. Maybe he, he, he did exaggerate because Ramses was faced, sorry, was saved at Kadesh because then another division came in the Nukov time, like uh, the, the cavalry in Ephraim, and attacked, attacked the Hittites from behind. Of course, Ramses does not mention this. Ramses, if you visit uh, Abu Simbel, for example, or, or others, he wants to show us that it was the Pharaoh who single-handedly defeated the Hittites. In fact, if you take a close look at this, you see Ramses with his chariot, beautiful chariot, trampling the Hittites. It happened differently. But I also, please remember that the context is very important. Today we live in a democracy. So we're constantly reminded by our politicians that what they do is for us. In the past, the mentality was different. The top, the leadership, had to not only be strong, not only be kingly, it had to be a divinity. Here, this is from Abu Simbel. Ramses, again, is killing a Hittite, as you see, <coughs> alone. Now, you can criticize Ramses as much as, as you want for being Dash at the Battle of Kadesh. I think he was Dash, but he was also very brave. But it was Ramses that then, reading the international relations correctly of the time, seeing that Egypt was also threatened by Libyans, the Hittites had their own enemies to face, so why not forge an alliance? But before you forge an alliance, you cannot continue skirmishing about Kadesh. So in one of the best public relations thing you could do with the other side is to make a peace treaty. This peace treaty, here I chose this picture deliberately, that's the Turkish foreign minister with Yutant, the one of the former secretary generals of the United Nations. This treaty signed between Ramses and Muwatalli, if I'm not mistaken, is at the UN headquarters today. It was granted by the Turkish government because they found the Hittite uh, copy of it. And it deals a lot. Remember what I told you at the beginning. Now, the foreigner is no longer the inherent enemy. It's no longer chaos. He's our friend. Ramses also takes a bride, a Hittite bride, the daughter of the king, 
Mutali as his spouse. I mean, he had another 66, <laughs> but it meant a lot. Why? Because it was, this was institutionalized peace. There was a continuous dialogue now. No more war relations. So what happened we dealt with external relations management to sum it up. To influence public opinion, John Marston says that there are four steps. Research. Ramses did this through the knowledge of Hittites. And also, very important, Ramses shifted Egypt's capital to the north. He built P. Ramses to be more centrally located to keep an ear what's going on and also to communicate, to communicate his strength and now the will to do peace with his northern neighbors. The action. He immediately went on a preemptive strike. Communication. He communicated a victory to earn public acceptance. A victory to give people peace of mind, to get the economy going. And as an evaluation, he probably got more mature and wise with age, so instead of going to war again, any other person might have gone back to war with the Hittites. The field belonged to Ramses. He was on the field unopposed. So sometimes you would think, why not strengthen internally and attack again? Instead, he was wise enough to forge the first world peace treaty. Now we move to internal relations management. This is equally important because now we're going to see how Ramses managed his image and in public relations. An image is like a picture. All your images make your reputation. So in the case when you have a relation to another person, all those experiences would make your reputation, how you perceived internally. There are four skills, ingratiations, flattering agreements, favors, and festivals. Ramses did employ especially festivals. Festivals were very important because in those days, in the absence of television and internet, it was very rare to see your leader. It was important to see your leader because if you saw your leader, you, you are sure that things are running well. The figurehead, that's extremely important. Self-promotion, publicizing personal connections. Ramses II did this by connecting himself to the great pharaohs of the past. And I dare say probably in his lifetime, he even tried to outshine them. Distancing oneself from negative events, Francis II distanced himself from Akhenaten's reign, totally. His was a continuation of that glorious Egyptian past. And again, I stress the fact that, strictly speaking, Egypt did not afford this anymore because the international relations had changed in Egypt, not, um, not in Egypt's favor anymore. And the fourth, fourth thing is you find senior partners. Of course, be him being a pharaoh, his only senior partner, or probably he was at par where with the gods, so you could see a lot of hieroglyphics and, and pictures of Ramses with gods like Horus, a very important Egyptian god of this kind. 
How did she do it? He perhaps cheated a little bit, Ramses. You know, for example, at Karnak Temple, he just first made a new entrance, his entrance, but then he also ordered over 130 columns in the form of papyrus trees. It's beautiful. I have been there countless times during my <coughs> four years stay in Egypt, and uh, I can tell you it is breathtaking. <coughs> when you walk at the Karnak Temple, it is as if you're walking in a gigantic forest. And if you just use a little bit your imagination to in fact, this, why did I choose this picture, not the usual archaeological <coughs> standard picture? Because color was very important. The use of color, and you could see it still on some columns, Egypt was not sandstone, as, as we imagine. It was, it was very colorful. Even the Egyptian way of life, the Egyptians were, of course they were concerned with the dead, but their culture, it was, it was a very lively culture that probably any, any of you here could associate with. This, of course, is not the aim of the, this lecture. And here is Abu Simbel. Abu Simbel was built at a very strategic place. It was built where? Because in the south of Egypt, in the region known as Nubia, there were the gold mines. Egypt could not afford to lose Nubia. So, if anyone threatened Egypt from the south, the first thing that they saw was this. Now, that's Ramses. Four images of Ramses, gigantic images of Ramses, carved in stone. They are not statues. So, it is as if you, they could rise against you. Remember also that the mentality of, of the time was very different from our mentality. He didn't stop there. The temple itself, twice a year, following the equinoxes, there is a sort of sophisticated light show. There are four statues in the inner sanctum, and the light enters and shines them for 20 minutes. But not all, only three. Why? Because the fourth is Ptah, the god of darkness. Now, that kind of precision, that kind of sophistication is, again, saying public relations internally and externally of Egyptian technological superiority over everyone else. You have to do trade with the pharaoh because the pharaoh knows best. This is probably one of the reasons why I personally have myself built a relationship with, with Ramses. Because Ramses was a human being. He was flawed. He was rash. But then he was a romantic. We said he had 67 wives. And probably, let's face it, he was the most powerful man of the time. We also know that Ramses for his time was tall and somewhat handsome, so he could have had any woman. But he loved one above all others. And his greatest and only love, I would dare say, is Nefertari. Nefertari, in fact, she has a smaller temple at Abu Simbel dedicated to her, just to her. That is the inside of the temple. You see how beautiful it is? It's still with color. And this is Nefertari herself. I think out of all the depictions that I have ever seen of Egyptian pharaohs, female pharaohs, I would say that she would be the most beautiful. And the description how she's described in the hieroglyphics, her hands, her, her hips, even her buttocks are described, but with great admiration. And there is emphasis that she is the most beautiful woman alive. I think that 
Ramses was, at the end of the day, a human being. In fact, my dentist, I, I invited him to this and uh, I got uh, to know something else about Ramses from my dentist, that he died of a tooth abscess. So he was really human. He was no different than, than any one of us. And the Ramesseum. <coughs> Pharaohs would build their own temple, but Ramses transformed his own temple into a public relations department. It was there that his, ta his scribes deliberately sustained the image of the Pharaoh throughout and beyond his reign. I invite you, if you have time in your lifetime, to go and visit these marvels. Any group leader will mention a name continuously, and that name is none other of Ramses the Great. No, other, no wonder that there were another 11 Ramses after him, made a fictional character in popular novels, and when, the, when Abu Simbel was threatened to be destroyed by the build of, building of the Aswan Dam, the world community went to the rescue because these things belong to everyone. We can see here civilization, sophistication, the rule of law. Questions? I hope I did stick to the time. Yeah, you've done very well. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, questions, anyone? Yes, your name, please? Uh, Peter. Hi, Peter. Uh, this is um, a little bit strange, I suppose, but uh, I, I tend to agree with you that. Uh, he may well be the founder of public relations. But I would suggest to you that he perhaps could more memorably be recalled as being the first spin doctor. <laughs> so I, think I know that yeah. the word <laughs> spin doctor is, is somewhat of a derogatory term in, probably in the real relations field, I would imagine. Because to my mind, what it implies is um, not really telling too much of the truth, that you just put forward a view which supports whatever cause you're trying to promote. Um, you don't have much um, regard for <coughs> the high ethical approach of public relations that the institutes and so on put forward. So speed doctoring, I guess, is a somewhat derogatory term. I think perhaps, perhaps is, um is a spin doctor more than a public relations person, but, but I do what your premise is that it could be regarded that way. But the Bhagavad Kadesh, for example, he didn't, according to the Hittites, they won't, according to Ramesses, he won't. The, the fact of the matter probably is that it was a stalemate, because after, after the battle of the being finished, neither empire extended their territory further north or further south. And as you pointed out very nicely, there was this first um, peace treaty, which is a wonderful thing. So I think a stalemate is probably a, a more realistic way of portraying it rather than a victory. Yet Ramses himself promoted his battle, his uh, uh, efforts, the superhuman efforts that he put in himself because all these troops are falling about him in terror that he came forward and did, as you said, uh, the superhuman job of actually, on his own, basically defeating the, uh, the Hittites. But I suspect what may have happened is that he, because he was such a very, very long-lived pharaoh, and he was a great monumental builder, that this is where the spin doctrine comes in. He, as you very clearly pointed out, um, had the role of promoting this sort of image of the pharaoh to the people. But I suspect what he, um, 
what he achieved was he built, I, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think he probably built more monuments in Egypt than anyone else, certainly more monuments <coughs> than himself than anyone else. Um, there was even quite a few statues of himself outside the Cairo Railway, railway Station until a few years ago. Um, so he had this great long period of time when he could actually write uh, the story of how he was this great pharaoh. And he wrote on everything that he built, didn't he? So he wrote on all the temples, he wrote on every monument. So in my mind, this is, this is sort of skipped off to me. It's the, the idea of putting across that um, you know, I'm the greatest, I'm the best emperor pharaoh that ever was, had this great win and all this sort of thing. And he did stop, you know, that's, that's true. But um, I think skin doctoring in, in that sense is more, more to the way I see him because he sort of was putting a view that just suited himself and his purpose in life rather than the truth. The, tr the truth was that he was a, a strong and, and pretty interesting sort of affair, but he wasn't a major, he wasn't a major general. He had um, no, no major uh, other sorts of things happening. And he was lucky to have come in and um, been the fair of Egypt at the time and they were at their greatest extent. But he didn't extend the Egyptian Empire very much. He stopped the Hittites. But so I think spin doctoring, sorry, sorry going on a bit, but I think spin doctoring, I, I was when I was listening to it, I thought, ah, you know, an alternative title to your talk could have been that the uh, man of public relations were just a spin doctor. And I thought that's the way I saw it. But I think thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting and uh, I enjoyed it. Okay, Chris, do you have a, any response to Yes. Yes, I did get this question from, from some people, and, and rightfully, rightfully so. I, I'll tell you something, actually, at least two things. When I embarked on, on this quest, Ramses, I deliberately ignored him, because this is also what I thought. And... I wished that the award would go to Hatshepsut. You know, we would have a female for a founding mother for once in a discipline dominated by women. But Hatshepsut was a spin doctor. She usurped the throne of her son and ruled as a man. Now, the second thing, context is very important. All pharaohs, I mean, Amenhotep III called himself as the dazzling sun disk. The, the mentality of Pharaoh, remember, is not to appear strong and the best, but godly. I think, and I, I, this, is, this is the basis of, of my admonition for Ramses, that at a time that maybe another Pharaoh would have led Egypt down the hill, Ramses, thanks to public relations, not spin, not spin, there was an element of spin. He didn't win totally alone at Kadesh. Yes, that spin. But it was, again, it's, it's the context, really. It's, it's like today. A politician makes a mistake. The best way to go for him is to apologize. Since Kennedy onwards, they apologize so easily. That's the way to do it. In the past, the way to do it, it's different. So I do understand your, your frustration because he could see, be seen as a very egocentric person by, by modern standards. But I think when you compare him to, to other pharaohs, another criticism that I can voice out myself, that under Ramses, the vast majority of the monuments he built cannot be compared to the sophistication of those built on, under Amenhotep. It was, everything was sort of more mass produced. Why? Because Egypt did not have the wealth it had in the past. So I don't use this actually against Ramses, I use it in his favor. Because you don't have the means and yet you still deliver. Yes? Yes, but I actually totally disagree. Um, sorry, with um, your point of view. And I, and, and I support the um, speaker in the sense that I don't believe that through history you had people who had some high ethical, moral sort of basis for trying to influence public opinion purely just to correct the view which was incorrect. They were trying to um, change a point of view or a perspective for their own ends. And in this day and age, and this, I know one shouldn't look back through history through the eyes of 
what happens today. Public relations firms do engage in an awful lot of spend. They're about trying to achieve some particular objective for their clients. And there's no great concern about ethics and morality, it's about winning. And uh, I think a lot of people in history have, um, have, have done that. Um, so that distinction between public relations and spin, um, I, just, I, I just can't draw those hard lines, I'm afraid. If, if Ramses, thank you, if Ramses was a monster, he would have been exposed because one of the things, <coughs> best things academics do is to really criticize leaders and, and expose them. Public relations have to have, yes, ethics, I totally agree, but everything is subjective to, to the age we live in. Some things mm, yes. that in the 19th century were considered to be very ethical, today are not. So, any more questions? I have to tell you just one last thing, which I think it was the, the, the thing that personally convinced me. There is a stela in Munich where at the back of this stela there are four ears. It's why it's important because the pharaoh hears petitions. So the first also two-way communication. Unlike other pharaohs who built the great pyramids at Giza, how big I am, how strong I am, you, it's one way from the top, the pharaoh, to everyone else. With Ramses, thanks to this tela, we know <coughs> that Ramses also heard. He could evaluate and he could understand public opinion. He had a network where petitions could be made to him, directly or indirectly. Two-way communication. So Ramses then is the founder of public relations because he went <coughs> all across, you know, tick the box, he ticked it all, he ticked them all. All right? Okay. It was, and just before we finish up, are there any other questions? Anything else that you've been cogitating on while we've been fascinated? Just before, just, before I, uh, just before I close, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Firstly, um, a couple of, well, I just want to point out a couple of things that I really liked. Firstly, there's nothing new under the sun. We think public relations, PR is something that's, you know, come down in the last shower, but it's really something that's been around a long time and they've been excellent practitioners. And uh, so that was pretty impressive. The second thing is that if you ever meet Ramses II in the afterlife and he's looking for a PR man, I think you're the one. <laughs> <laughs>